Jesus, the loudspeaker spoke up and said. Years ago, shifting through a stack of tattered and torn periodicals and old pulps at a used bookstore, a particular issue of Weird Tales caught my eye. As I drew the issue out of the stack and lightly ran my hand over the cover to toss any dust off, it revealed a striking erotic cover, something that had extended beyond anything I had ever seen before in the cover of a pulp magazine. At the bottom of that cover, I found the artist's signature, M. Brundage. This set me on a short journey of sorts to discover more about who M. Brundage was. Margaret Hedda Johnson, known to most as Margaret Brundage, was born in December 1900 in Chicago, Illinois. Following her father's death in 1910, she was raised exclusively by her devoted Christian scientist mother and maternal grandmother. And although she is confirmed to have studied fashion design at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts from 1921 to 1923, per what school records show, she failed to officially graduate and had no other formal artistic training that I could find. Based on employment records, in 1925, it is evident that she was working for a local Chicago fashion industry company, primarily as a contractor, doing pen and ink designs, but there is little evidence to foreshadow of what was to come. In 1927, Margaret was married to Myron Brundage, and later that year, in August, the young couple were blessed with a son, Curlin Brundage. It is not until 1932 a full seven years since entering professional work in the fashion industry that Margaret's story begins to enter the realm for what she is renowned today, at least in my circles, as the September issue of Oriental Stories carried her cover. Popular Fiction Publishing, the publisher of Oriental Stories, was impressed enough with Margaret's work, and especially the sales numbers of the issue in question, to continue to contract her throughout that year for several other publications. First, The Magic Carpet, and most famously, Weird Tales. All told, Brundage produced 66 original pulp covers to Weird Tales from 1933 to 1945. Most often highlighting women, her work was notorious for pushing the acceptable limits with sexual suggestivity. Although really, there's, there's nothing suggestive about it. This was a time when there were minimal constraints on what could be presented, and the envelope was constantly being pushed to stand out on the newsstand as the pulp scene continued to explode. It was cutthroat to get sales, and Margaret's work delivered in spades. Beyond the remarkable, risque approach to her art, Brundage was also unique in that all of her work was created with pastels on simple illustration board. There was no use of pencils or inks, Despite her reputed skill with both, based on statements from those who knew her and the experience she had from her brief work in the Chicago fashion industry. Brundage's covers, because of the sultry stylings and vibrant scenes, as stated earlier, proved to be very popular with the readers of Weird Tales. But most of the public was not actually aware of Margaret being a woman, as all of her work was simply signed M. Brundage, as I mentioned earlier. This was common at the time for many female artists, and many worked years, if not their whole career, without it ever being revealed who they actually were. This anonymity, sadly, did not last for Margaret, as outcry amongst puritanical social forces led the publisher to eventually re reveal the artist was indeed a woman in hopes to mollify the offended. It completely backfired. The readership, that had clamored for each new M. Brundage cover, recoiled in horror that a woman could produce such erotic art. When William Delaney, owner and publisher of the Pulp Short Stories, purchased Weird Tales, the magazine's offices were moved to New York City and Margaret's workload began to slowly dry up. Now, there, rumors have persisted that work was continued to be offered to Margaret and she just refused to comply to any shackles or limitations placed on her images although there is very little information to confirm this. What is known, however, and is quite provable, is that she did continue to do occasional assignments for the magazine throughout the next seven years. At the same time her regular work was drying up from Weird Tales, 
her marriage had completely fallen apart. By 1939, after 12 years together, Margaret was granted a divorce to her alcoholic and neglectful husband. Margaret and her son would then move in with her mother, who sadly passed away the following year. Margaret continued to live in Chicago in relative poverty for the rest of her life, creating fantasy scenes still in pastels for her own amusement. Her son, Kierlin, passed away at the age of 44 in 1972, and it was not until after her own death at the age of 75 on April 9, 1976, that a resurgence of interest in her work began to slowly grow, signifying the artist's continued popularity and the growth of this fandom. In 2008, her September 1932 cover for Weird Tales was sold at auction for over $50,000. Margaret's work is often compared to pinup artist Rolf Armstrong's work, and ten- telltale influence from her pieces are seen throughout contemporary grades, from the like Frank Frazetta to Michael Wayland. And that is the story behind M. Brundage. I am Aldous on the farm. Thank you for watching.